Good day, my students. I welcome you all for another segment of our discussion, which has to do with the continuation of the course we took in our previous semester, that is first semester, and particularly ENG 111, which is Introduction to English Grammar. This is the second segment, which is a continuation of that one. I'm by name Dr. Ubaidullah Muhammad Bello. And the first topic with me here for our consumption is Alomovs. Alomov is referred to any of the phonological variants of a morpheme realized in different environments. In other words, it is also known as a bound morpheme that is phonologically conditioned. This issue of Alomov one has to understand first what is a bound morpheme morpheme is just a smallest meaningful linguistic unit of a word and this morpheme is said to be classified into two we have free morpheme and we have bound morpheme okay allomorphs do not have anything to do with free morphemes as the name implies free morphemes are morphemes that can stand on their own to reflect meaning variation and to have a hold of their content in terms of meaning consumption. But when talking about bound morpheme, it is also known as dependent morpheme. It relies on the free morpheme for its own stance and to reflect meaning out of its own usage based on the context within which it is used. By this, I'm trying to just justify that allomorphs are bound morphemes. They are never free morphemes. Okay, now, spe uh, specifically, allomorphs here are those variants of morphemes, not the free morphemes themselves, but the bound ones are usually known as the ED past tense marker, the S singular and plural marker, these two are the ones we call bound morphemes that can as well be called allomorphs. And you can bear me witness that it is not everywhere you see the use of this S inflectional morphemic item or the ED inflectional morphemic item that you just can conclude their own pronunciations. No, basically we have to look at how they are used, in what context okay in what phonological context or condition do we see them that would tell us what kind of pronunciation effect they have for instance we have hoped h-o-p-e-d we have the ed there and the pronunciation reflects t sound hoped we have lack which is lacked t sound fake with d faked with t sound laugh with laughed as in t sound wish wished t sound kiss kissed t sound and the rest it means it is not all time that you see the ed and you conclude by saying it is having d sound but it can also have the variation of what t sound based on how it is used so this ed bound morphine has three different pronunciations it is either t or d or id as in i and d id it is t or d or id it means it has three different pronunciations this is why we say it is a bound morpheme okay that is phonologically conditioned and that is why we call it as well an alomorph take for instance we have beg the past of which we have begged if you force the sound on the pronunciation of begged in the past you're going to just have a float of what you are not supposed to have it means it is not begged but begged the sound it is not we have the second example grabbed it is not grabbed it is grabbed the sound we have loved it is not loved but loved with the sound raised raised d sound not raised it is d sound we have several other examples like that 
it means the ed reflects different variations of pronunciation depending on where it is used we have communicated it is the same ed that we find in the previous examples that reflect the t and the d we also have them here we have the ed which is a bound morpheme but when it is found in the communicate okay here we have only the d sound sorry uh the d as in letter attached to the already root word communicate but it is not communicated it is not communicate it is not communicated it's not even possible but the pronunciation is communicated communicated it has it sound we have conduct it carries ed inflectional morphemic item and it is not you cannot force the auto on it it is just what it conducted we have demanded we have recorded we have reminded we have located you see the same ed ed in all these words we've cited samples on but they have variations they have a kind of variant okay of pronunciation and this is why we call this ed bound morphemic item as one of the alomorphs we have in english okay the next alomorph is s s we call it s inflectional morphemic item it is used in the formation of plural forms of words okay okay this s too just like what we have sampled in the preceding alomorph we now say it has three different pronunciations too we have the s we have the z and we have the is as in i and z i z is I repeat s z and is okay with this let's see these examples for instance we have lasts lasts you see it is the same s sound we have lacks s sound hopes s sound bats s sound breaks s sound but when you see it in the word leg in the plural form of the leg you add s but the pronunciation does not account for s sound it accounts for z sound so it is legs we have clubs we have demands we have loves we have dogs etc so you see here the pronunciation phonologically conditioning okay the particular bound morphemic item reflects its pronunciation not as s but z then we have the last one which i mentioned okay is as in is the last pronunciation variant and it is present in a word like push pushes church churches judge judges barge barges and the rest but the same s that we know is there so this is what we call alomorph the next topic is syntactic analysis that is sentence element and sentence analysis you know anything that has to do with syntactic analysis it has to do with what we call analysis of the syntax of a language and by syntax we mean a branch of linguistics that has to do with the combination of words okay to form stretches like phrases clauses and sentences okay at every time you have a sentence before you you can use what we call a, a particular model of analyzing that sentence okay now syntax as one of the major components of grammar has enjoyed some dominance especially during the 19th century okay 20th and even 21st centuries linguistics re, uh, revitalization altogether this is because during this period okay much attention was given to syntactic units structures of sentences and their analysis and this is why we have different models of doing this justice for analysis at this juncture we can use structural model of syntactic analysis and the rest this model again is called spoka or svoka if you have s p o c a or s p o okay um s p o s v o c k or s v o p a svoka or spoka 
anyone you choose it's referring to the same thing because the which is verb is still the same p which is predicate okay though some scholars will tell you that when you go deep they have a kind of differences yes they do have but it is another way of replacing verb when we mean what predicate and this is an element of sentence that you can use in analyzing a sentence okay now we have a lot of things to do but we actually are going to just stick to some sentences to see how each of these things refer to okay s stands for subject p stands for predicate L stands for object and C stands for complement while A stands for adjunct. We are not saying that every sentence must have this element. No. But you have to know one thing. There are two major elements of a sentence. Every sentence is supposed to have them. And these are the S and the P or the S and the V. Okay? But any other one like the O, which is object, the C, which is complement, and the adjunct or A are just optional depending on what speaker or writer intends to express in their own language use. Okay, what do you mean by S? S, subject of a sentence. It has to do with the doer of an action, somebody doing something. Okay, we have the P which is the predicate or the verb the action being performed by the subject we also have o which is uh, sorry object recipient or receiver of the action being performed and we have the complement okay which is either of the subject or the object something or a word referring you back to the subject or referring you back to the object we call it complement and the last one is adjunct which is either a verb okay or a kind of a prepositional phrase or even an adjectival phrase depending on the choices being chosen by a writer or a speaker okay now understanding what these elements are okay the subject the predicate or verb the object the complement and the adjunct okay let's now look at how we can see them in our sentences okay now let's take this first example Ubaidullah is Musti's friend Ubaidullah is Musti's friend Ubaidullah is a subject because the subject matter of the sentence lies on Ubaidullah is Musti's friend is there is our predicate or our verb and this is just to tell you that verb must not be an action word we have several examples of verbs that do not show anything like action. It mustn't be slap, it mustn't be hug, it mustn't be um, beat for you to say it is a verb. Is is a verb and we call it predicate. Then must is friend, okay, a subject complement because it refers you back to who? The subject. Who is must is friend? Ubaidallah. Who is Ubaidallah must is friend? You see, this is what we call subject complement. Another example is Abu Bakr has been calling me since morning. Here you see we have S. Abu Bakr has been calling is one thing, predicate. Why is it one thing? Because has is a verb. If you can remember our auxiliary verbs we discussed in our previous semester, has is a verb which is primary auxiliary verb under verb group of have and it is called has. Then been. It is under primary auxiliary verb two under verb group of B and the calling is the main verb. All these two are auxiliary to the main verb calling because they are helping it to carry out its function. Then the whole of the three words are called predicate. Then me, okay, Abakara has been calling me. Me now is the recipient of the action calling. Therefore. It is object of that sentence. Since morning adds more information. It amplifies the word calling. Somebody would say, Abakar has been calling me. Somebody would ask, when or since when? You now say, since morning. Since morning of what? Of the calling. Therefore, it is what? Giving you more information on the verb calling. And this is what we call adjunct. 
adjunct okay this is just to amplify the verb are we there okay now the example is she gave me musa sorry she gave musa the book she gave musa the book she is our subject the doer of the action the action is gave which is the predicate at the same time Musa is a recipient, uh, sorry, recipient or the receiver of the action. But here we have two objects. We have Musa and the book. Here we now see we have direct object and we have indirect object. What is direct object? The book. And what is indirect object? Musa. Because the book has to take the chances of what? of being in the position of the uh, the subject of the sentence before musa is able to receive it and this is why the direct object appears at the end while musa appears at the uh position before the book and this is where we have spoo depending on what you see or what you write i told you that is how you can generate all these sentence elements the first one is spc the second one is spoa and the third one is spoo in fact sometimes you can only have sp which are the two major or predominant sentence elements for instance i died i is a subject died is a predicate it doesn't require any object you cannot even force object on it and this is how actually you can do syntactic analysis okay of any sentence you have before you if you know what they stand for you will be able to generate all these things the next topic is the concept of phrase and types the concept of phrase has been defined as any syntactic unit that is not a clause but has a function as a whole within a larger construction what we're trying to say is a phrase is not a clause and it is not a sentence and how do we determine a, a, a phrase in english you can simply say it is a combination of words put together in order to form a sense unit in other words it is it can be regarded as a single word or a group of two or more words without both subject and predicate and which does not make a complete sense it means a phrase can be a single word or a group of words and in the grouping of these words you have you must not find the presence of both subject and predicate once you have the two together it is not a phrase it is either a clause or a sentence so a phrase can be just a single word or a group of words for instance my name is a phrase your name is a phrase your father's name is a phrase. This Nasara State University, Nasara State University is a group of words. And it is a phrase because when you continue to mention the name of this school hundred times, there will be no complete sense because it lacks presence of both subject and predicate. Okay, now we have types of phrase. We have noun phrase, we have verb phrase, we have adjectival phrase, we have prepositional phrase and even gerundal phrase let's start with the noun phrase noun phrase is common in almost all languages because there will be no language without words that show names given to things around us or even our identities and it is frequently used by many people and depending on what kind of language you have at your disposal now phrases are also known as nominal phrases or nominal groups and they are usually abbreviated as mp or ng respectively okay what is a noun phrase simply a noun phrase is just either a single word or a group of words in which the head word the precedent among the words is a noun it means all other words that would be used together with it are just auxiliaries but it is the head word take for instance the most dreadful road accident in this five words there is just one major word and that is accident it means the determiner most dreadful road which are qualifiers are only working on accident it means the most dreadful road accident 
is what is an example of a noun phrase because accident is a noun and it is the head word it is a precedent of all these words thou cannot function without it must cannot function without it dreadful and even wrote okay in this context wrote cannot function without accident which is a noun in fact wrote if you put it in another place it's even a noun on its own but what it does operationally here is to qualify the accident to mean that it is a road accident okay not a kind of a, a, a railway accident and the rest so another example is you know this noun phrase must not be the presence of a noun as a hair word alone you know we have substitutions for nouns and what is what is that pronouns it means a noun phrase can either be a single word which is a pronoun or a single word which is a noun or combination of words where the noun is the head word as we've seen examples or it is just the one word we call pronoun it is also in a sentence referred to as a noun phrase for instance the most dreadful word accident can be replaced with what it which is it it has happened the most dreadful road accident has happened you can now say it has happened that it is an example of a noun phrase because we don't have anything like pronoun phrase okay if you see other examples they still show you the same thing i have explained like sweet cucumbers we purchased they were purchased so sweet cucumbers noun phrase they noun phrase the doctor arrived the doctor arrived the doctor here okay is actually another noun phrase so it means noun phrase can function as subject of the sentence it can function as object of the sentence and it can also uh, function as complement of the subject or complement of the object just for instance the doctor arrived Do the doctor here is subject okay Obaid needs a doctor here it is an object because it receives the action needs then Obaid is a doctor a doctor here is subject complement because it tells you who Obaid is not that it is receiving the action Obaid is a doctor Obaid and doctor stand for one person but here Obaid needs a doctor in fact it means Obaid is a different person and a doctor is a different person this is how we differentiate between object and complement of the subject okay now the next one is verb phrase simply verb phrase is a group of words or a single word in which the head word is a verb very simple the head word has to be a verb just take for instance when you say cats fight this fight alone which is a verb answers what we call a verb phrase you say mary laughed it also illustrates instances of single word verb phrases as predicate so a verb phrase can be just one word or a group of words you can say cats have been fighting so from have been fighting is a group of words and the three are verbs the three now exemplify what we call a verb phrase so it is very very simple when you know what a verb is and what actually you can have to be called a verb because a sentence can have either a single verb or just two verbs or three verbs in some context four verbs but if you know them as verbs underline them and put one thing what is that verb phrase cat fight fight is the only verb it's a verb phrase cats have been fighting have auxiliary verb been auxiliary verb fighting okay main verb the three give you one thing what is that verb phrase and this is how we generate instances of what what we call verb phrase okay now the next one is adverbial phrase adverbial phrases as the name implies okay have to do with adverbs and they are phrases that we say the head word among the words okay comprised in the phrase has to do with what an adverb it means if you call it a verbal phrase the head word in the words has to be what an adverb 
Okay now. Adverbial phrases are sometimes called adjuncts as introduced in the or into the grammar treatment by Sasorian tradition. Okay, Ferdinand de Saussure. Okay, Saussurean tradition in structural linguistic model. Okay now, adverbial phrase or phrases with adverbs as heads or sole realizations. We can see examples like this. The woman cooks. The woman is the subject. Cooks is our verb. Then interestingly, okay, is an adverbial phrase because it works just to tell you more on the word cooks, which is a verb. You know, adverb amplifies a verb. So if it is just one adverb, adverbial phrase. If it is a group of two adverbs, Joined together by a conjunction, you underline the two, including the conjunction, and make them what? Adverbial phrase. Okay, Peter was playing last week. This last week tells you more on playing. So it is an adverbial phrase reflecting what we call time. So adverbial phrases have to reflect either time, okay, condition, manner, reason or even please for instance we will stay there there is an adverb or adverbial phrase what does it do it shows what location or place we will stay there there is an adverbial phrase and this is how in fact if you know what an adverb is okay or what an adjunct is underline it and put straightly adverbial phrase either it is just one word or combination of two or three words but functioning as just what a single adverb can do it is called adverbial phrase okay now the next one is prepositional phrase prepositional phrase it is also a type of phrase where the head word is a preposition which introduces other variables of what we call linguistic unit in some languages, prepositional phrases are not so prominent. Not all languages. Just like what we have mentioned about noun phrases and verb phrases. Almost all languages in the world have these two. But a prepositional phrase is not prominent in, in most languages that exist. Okay, now. Prepositional phrases are known to be housed under adverbial phrases. Mostly... When you have what we call adverbial phrases, you have a preposition introducing that particular stretch. And this is why we popularly can call prepositional phrases too as what? Adjunct. And that is what differentiates adjunct from just ordinary adverb. Because adverb can just be an adjunct, but not all adjuncts are adverbs. Because we have prepositional phrases that can also function as what? Adjunct. Okay, now. Let's see these examples of prepositional phrases. The man is around that corner. The man is around that corner. Around is a preposition. Then around that corner, from around till the end, will give you prepositional phrase. Put the book under the chair. Under the chair. Okay? Under the chair is a prepositional phrase introduced by the preposition, which is a head word at the same time. Under. He is inside the room. Inside is a preposition. Introducing the room. Therefore, the whole of these three words give you what we call prepositional phrase. Okay, now, in all these examples we've given of noun phrase, verb phrase, adverbial phrase, prepositional phrases, pick them, keep them aside, watch them, look at them, examine them. You discover that they do not convey completeness of meaning. They do not convey complete sense in themselves. And they do not have both the presence, I mean, of both subject and predicate. And that is why we can call them what? Phrases. In or based on the definition we have given. The next topic is close. This is defined as a linguistic unit that constitutes both subject and predicate in it, but which may stand to express complete sense or lack the completeness of meaning, which is its version that distinguishes it from a sentence. If you can remember, phrase we say does not have the presence of both subject and predicate, okay? But a clause has 
the presence of both subject and predicate. Phrase we say lacks completeness of meaning because of the absence of these two. But a clause, sorry, phrase lacks the presence of the two and as such does not express completeness of sense. But a clause has. You get it. It has. But still, some other ways we can see there is a version of a clause that can express complete sense and there is a version of a clause that cannot express complete sense. What are we saying? It means the presence of both subject and predicate sometimes does not suffice to mean that they are well, well equipped to express completeness of sen uh, sense or meaning or thought. And that is actually what differentiates a clause sometimes from what a sentence is. Because both phrase and clause can be found within the sentence structure. But we have to know what they are and how we can differentiate them. With this, we have types of clues. We have one main clues, which is also known as independent clues. And we have subordinate clues, which is also known as dependent clues. Very simple. When we say someone is the main person, what does that, does that mean? It implies that the person is independent and many things rely on on it and under its custody okay we're saying a clause that is main is independent because it can stand on its own in some linguistic context to be referred to as a sentence since it gives complete sense but some that are called subordinate clauses or dependent clauses as the name implies they depend on the main clauses for their stance if not despite the fact that they constitute the presence of both subject and predicate still they cannot stand to express a complete sense and these are the examples starting from main clues okay we now say i slapped the man i slapped the man who married my wife the whole of this gives you one sentence i slapped the man who married my wife but you know that i slapped the man is the only main clues it can stand on its own if you remove it away from who married my wife so i slap the man in this sentence is main clause okay and if you write it somewhere it can take it full stop and stand on its own this is why we call it a main clause the woman slept already when i arrived the all of this the whole of it is one sentence but we have two clauses we have the woman slept already and we have when i arrived do you know that the woman slept already can stand on its own not even in this togetherness with this other part but when i arrived cannot stand on its own so it means this sentence is compartmentalized into two close structures of which we have main clause and we have subordinate clause and that is it for what we mean by main clause in as much as you can remove it and put it somewhere to stand on its own and to reveal complete sense in itself we call it main clause okay now subordinate clause we already explained dependent clause it is a version which cannot stand on its own to express complete sense example as soon as i left as soon as i left you see as soon as i is your subject i particularly then left is a predicate do you think it can stand on its own the whole these words cannot stand on their own to it when you say as soon as i left somebody would ask you what next what happens okay unlike the main clause we said i slapped the man i is a subject slapped the man is the predicate it can stand on its own as well anywhere but here, as soon as I left, needs the presence of another part we call main clause. It cannot stand on its own. Another example is, when I saw her, when I saw her, underline when I, subject, saw her, predicate. You have the two, subject and predicate, but no complete sense. When I saw her, what happens? Somebody may ask you. Another example is after we took our dinner, after we took our dinner, after we subject took our dinner, predicate, what next? What happened? Somebody would ask. So it means <laughs> the presence of the two, subject and predicate, it's never a guarantee for you to have it as a sentence or as a clause 
that can stand on its own and to complete sense in itself it depends on what it is we can have main and we can have subordinate okay subordinate clause has its types yes we have one noun clause we have adjectival or relative clause okay and we have what uh adverbial clause for what you have gathered in your explanation and understanding of phrases as verb noun phrases or whatever if you know what a noun is and you know what an adverb is or adjective it is very simple for you to understand all these things okay take him for a first explanation the noun clause as the name implies it is just like a single noun but it's a clause because it has the two parts main uh subject and the predicate this is a type of clause that functions as a single noun does it performs the grammatical functions of subject object or complement in a sentence for instance that i can marry you is a welcome idea that i is subject can marry you is predicate and the entire combination now gives you one thing what is that noun phrase because it is just like saying marrying is a welcome idea or marriage is a welcome idea just to replace the entire word with just marriage marriage is a welcome idea marriage is a noun okay but here we are saying noun close why is it noun close because there are both subject and predicate and the entirely uh structuring modality okay we reveal that it is just standing for one thing and that is what a noun clause functioning as subject of the sentence our predicate is is a welcome idea it means within the subject we have what both subject and predicate and the rest of the part is your predicate that i can marry you has both subject and predicate and these two come together to stand for one thing what is that subject of the entire sentence then is a welcome idea gives you predicate what she does is electrifying what she does is our noun clause why is it a noun clause because it stands just like one thing or subject of the sentence that is its name in this sentence and we have to know one thing anytime we mention subject object complement mostly they have to do with nouns or pronouns so anything that functions like them okay it's just to either call them noun clauses or noun phrases it is phrase when it doesn't have the two subjects and predicate and it is a close when it has the two but if it starts to work just like a single noun either functioning as subject or object or complement you call it a noun close the next one is adjectival clause or relative clause. We all know the word of adjective. It qualifies or modifies a noun or quantifies a noun or a pronoun. As the name implies, it is a type of clause that functions like a single adjective. It modifies or qualifies a noun or a pronoun in a sentence. For instance, the man who married my daughter. See what we underlined here. The man who married my daughter is handsome. Who married my daughter is giving you more information on the man okay therefore it means the man is the subject okay you can say the man is handsome but you are saying the man who married my daughter is handsome it means you are using a clause who married my daughter which is subordinate clause to qualify the man it is a clause because it has who which is a subject married my daughter predicate but the whole of this word does or do one thing what is that thing qualification or modification of the noun man so and anything that qualifies or modifies a noun or a pronoun is adjective so we don't call this one adjective alone because it is just not one word but combination of words revealing subject and predicate so the entire structure we call it an adjectival clause you see the game which we played was amazing and one thing you should know of what we are saying is all these things on the line which are called adjectival clauses you can remove them and the sentence can stand on its own but when you put them you discover that, that you are generating more information to the subject the game everybody knows the game was amazing 
But somebody would ask which game you now say the game which we played was amazing so which we played is now working on the game to mean that it is modifying it and game is a noun so it is adjectival close because which we is subject played is predicate okay here is the girl whom i spoke to you about whom i spoke to you about is qualifying the girl and it is a close and what does it do it qualifies right the girl and whatever qualifies a a noun because girl is a noun is an adjective so we call it adjectival close because it has whom i to mean the subject spoke to about predicate the last one in this uh types is adverbial close it works or functions like a single adverb but it's a close and that is why we say it is having both subject and predicate but it functions just like a single adverb can do let's see these examples you may go wherever you want wherever you want is an adverbial close and of what of please and what does it do it tells you more on go you may go wherever you want so it amplifies the verb go and that is why it is said to be what adverbial close when one is busy time flies time flies when one is busy so the whole of when one is busy tells you more on flies and flies here is our verb therefore when one is busy amplifies the flies which is a verb and that is an adverbial close because it has when one a subject and is busy as what predicate and you know that adverbial clauses of whatever types okay have these positions of either initial position medial position or terminal position do you know why you can say wherever you want you may go or you say when one is busy time flies or time flies when one is busy or because i was sick i could not come or i could not come because i was sick this is one of the characteristic features of an adverbial close and you can discover that even a single adverb has this kind of operational implications you can say beautifully i slapped you i beautifully slapped you i slapped you beautifully you can use initial position okay medial or terminal just like what you can do for these clauses we call adverbial clauses one thing you should know is they function like adverb but they are clauses because they have the two parts of what we call subject and predicate that is it for adverbial clause our next topic is sentence all writing is based on sentences in other forms of communication it is often acceptable to speak in any form that gets the meaning across however in writing one needs sentences and these sentences have to be what correct okay what is a sentence as i'm telling you now as i'm telling you now grammarians in the world still have problem of identifying what really can be used to mean or refer to what a sentence is all about some people will say a sentence is a group of words expressing a complete sense this and that M many scholars have argued that it is even beyond that or it is not even like that so what we now do is just to have at least some ideas of what a sentence is but one thing that everybody must agree with is a sentence has to do with a group of words okay and some will tell you that the presence of both subject and predicate must be there achieved before you can call it a sentence and some will tell you that it has to express a complete sense or meaning but there are a lot of arguments till now of what a sentence is so a sentence according to what we have brought for your consumption is a set of words expressing a statement a question emotion or an order usually containing subject and a verb it is a group of words consisting of both subject and predicate which expresses a complete sense of thought in a summary a sentence is a group of words that are, are or are put together to mean something anytime you have a group of words having the subject and predicate to mean something complete in itself we can tag it as what as a sentence let's take for example you say um abu 
it abu it abu is a name of a person which is a subject it is a verb which shows an action so the subject abu is a noun that is doing the verb and the main verb is it and it is just the verb there so in english many other languages the first word of a written sentence begins with a capital letter and at the end of a sentence there is usually a period or a full stop that is when you are writing but if you are not writing you have nothing to do with uh full stop or something to do with any of the uh, mechanics of writing okay now we have types of sentence and these types of sentence are further classified based on the following one we have types according to structure and two we have types according to function it means you can know what type is based on the function it performs and you can know what type of a sentence is based on the structure you'll be able to find so generally speaking there are two categories of sentence which i have made mention types according to function and types according to what structure <clears throat> okay let's start with function function has to do with the use you use a sentence to either give command ask a question just declare or make a statement or show emotion okay so it functions to do all these things the first one under these types according to function we have declarative sentence which is a sentence whose sole function is to declare or to make statement for instance i am recording my lms i'm just declaring i'm not asking a question i'm not showing emotion and i'm not giving command so it is just declarative you are looking at me you are looking at me we are here we have a class this is ict declarative sentences the next one is interrogative sentence if it is not showing emotion or declaration or command then it is asking a question if you use any sentence to ask a question we call it interrogative sentence for instance are you looking at me am i recording my lms is this ict center are we in national state university it functions to ask a question and that is what we call interrogative sentence the next one is exclamatory sentence from the word exclamatory it has to do with exclamation and that carries our own thought about a sentence not asking a question not just declaring but showing emotion for instance oh what a lovely sight god she just dropped dead wow i love ict Woo! this is national state university ops i'm sorry you see they show emotions and we call them exclamatory sentences the last one is imperative sentence which has to do with the sentence that expresses an order or authority examples leave this office now it is not just declaring it is giving an order you must come tomorrow you must come tomorrow it applies to the relevance of giving an order too we call it imperative okay now the second category is types of sentence according to structure 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 now okay we have one simple sentence we have two compound sentence we have three multiple sentence we have four compound complex sentence and we have five um sorry we have compound sentence we have multiple sentence we have complex sentence and we have compound complex sentence which is the fifth one okay now starting with simple sentence as the name implies it is simple because it revolves around just one idea and not all elongated in wordings it is just equivalent to one main clause just one main clause it means our idea or knowledge of main clause would help us here in fact not only main clause for us to understand types according to structure we have to understand and use or utilize our knowledge of main clause and subordinate clause okay simple sentence is just a single main clause it is a sentence that has only one finite verb and with no any additional bound or subordinate clauses okay it is just consists of uh only one main clause as i said and traditionally it is a shortest type of a sentence because it does not contain 
any inflected element of any close tie. Examples, Ubaid is here. Just one idea. Rabi was the one. We will go to the market later. Just one, one idea. Or your compound sentence. Compound. Combination of two simple sentences. Two simple sentences combined together with the use of conjunction. We call it compound sentence. It is compound because the two main clauses joined together by conjunction can stand on their own and typify the sense of complete meaning. For instance, Hajia went inside the room and packed all her belongings. Hajia went inside the room is a main clause. She packed all her belongings. We remove she here because we say Hajia went inside the room and packed all. Somebody would have said Hajia went inside the room and she packed all her belongings. It's just a repetition. But if you remove Hajia went inside the room and and you have to apply she packed all her belongings, then it is simple sentence too. So the two main clauses are joined together with a conjunction and. Or Benga read the book for us. Main clause. Then he asked everyone to comment on it. Another main clause. Joined together with and. This is what we call compound sentence. When you have two simple sentences joined together. Two main clauses. Main clauses or independent clauses joined together with a conjunction or by a conjunction then you call it compound sentence the next one is multiple sentence this is a type of sentence that contains or houses at least three main clauses or symbol sentences joined by conjunctions the compound we say two main clauses or symbol sentences a multiple sentence the sentences are at least sorry clauses the free or independent clauses are at least three and they can stand on their own when we remove them away from one another. Example, we lost our courage, lost our ability, and lost also our goal. It can be we lost our courage, we lost our ability, we also lost our goal. Each one here is a main clause. It can stand on its own. And we have three joined together. Therefore, it is a multiple sentence. Well, I married her. And she loves me, but my friend hates us. I married her can stand on its own. She loves me can stand on its own. My friend hates me. These are main clauses and can stand on their own. And that is what we call multiple sentence. The next one is complex sentence. Complex sentence. This is a type of sentence that houses only one main clause and one or more subordinate clauses. When you have one main clause, together with one subordinate clause or two subordinate clauses we call it complex sentence for example Ubaid was the one Ubaid was the one this is a main clause it can stand on its own who maltreated the boy who maltreated the boy is a subordinate clause because in this sentence, it is not an interrogative sentence. It is not asking the question. No, it is amplifying the noun, one. Therefore, it is a subordinate clause in this context. Ubaid was the one, main clause, who maltreated my boy, subordinate clause, because the boy could not stomach his bullying everyone. It's another subordinate clause. So you see, we have two subordinate clauses and one main clause. This is complex sentence. Next example is the man whose bicycle was stolen is for retribution. Is for retribution. Here you can remove whose bicycle was stolen and you'll be left with the man is here for retribution. It means you are infusing subordinate clause in between the subject and predicate of the main clause. I don't know whether you're getting it. So this is an adjectival clause. Okay? An adjectival clause is a type of subordinate clause. Therefore, whether we like it or not, there are two clauses here. The man is here for retribution is our main clause. Whose bicycle was stolen is our uh, subordinate clause. Therefore, we call it complex sentence. The last one is compound complex sentence. 
this type of sentence has at least two main clauses unlike complex that is one main clause and at least one subordinate clause this one compound complex sentence has to house at least two main clauses then at least one or more than one subordinate clauses this is what we call compound complex sentence let's take for example when i saw her cannot stand on its own so it is a subordinate clause she was looking feverish she was looking feverish can stand on its own main clause and i asked for her health records can also stand on its own it means two main clauses are joined together by what a conjunction and and the introducer clause is a subordinate clause so here we have two main clauses and one subordinate clause it gives us an example of compound complex sentence second example we got married and traveled to india where we sang and danced we got married can stand on its own we traveled to india can stand on its own it means the two main clauses are joined with the conjunction and and where we sang and danced cannot stand on its own so it's a subordinate clause so these are the last example too as soon as she left subordinate clause i cried and my mother lapped me two main clauses i cried is a main clause my mother lapped me is a main clause joined together with conjunction and and as soon as she left cannot stand on its own it's a subordinate clause therefore one subordinate clause and two main clauses joined together by a conjunction and that is it for compound complex sentence and for this particular topic see you next and happy time ahead thank you